Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I am joined with author and archaeologist Frank Holt. Frank is one of the world's leading authorities on Alexander the Great, Hellenistic Asia and new research methodologies such as cognitive numismatics. Today we are joined by Frank who is going to tell us all about his new book When Money Talks, a history of coins and numismatics, published by Oxford University Press. Thank you so much for joining me today. Do you want to start off by telling us a bit about what your book is all about? Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, the book is uh, a subtitle, A History of Coins and Numismatics. And though coins may seem mundane and uh, the, the sort of thing that you carry around in great numbers and yet hardly ever look at, but coins are actually like an encyclopedia of world history. And so I've I've become very interested over the years in how much historical information can be derived from examining coins. And the study of coins and the curation of coins is called numismatics. And so the book covers both the sort of history of money in general, but coins in particular, and also the history of the study of coins from ancient times. Coins were studied almost as soon as they were invented down to our own day. Coins came along around 620, 630 BC. So we're talking about uh, you know, somewhere around 2,600 years, 26 centuries. But, uh, and so coins don't tell us a lot about um, early Mesopotamia or about Pharaonic Egypt, but don't despair. In the book, I talk about how the world managed before coins were invented. And then once coins were invented by the Lydians, a kingdom in what is now uh, Turkey, and were quickly um, copied and uh, expanded by their neighboring Greeks, from that point on, coins became uh, a, an enormously significant factor in world history, not just for economic reasons, but they speak to our social and intellectual and artistic and religious and military lives as well. And as a result of that, I found that um, as an ancient historian, often bereft of information, coins provide our, our best answer. I, I say at the beginning of the book, I didn't go into uh, history for the money. I went into money for the history. And that's because as a grad student, I became interested in what happened to all those Greeks that Alexander left behind in what is now Afghanistan? And that's a, that's a marvelous story, but it's a story that can only really be told through the coins that were left behind through numismatics. And so as a grad student, my professor said, well, you want to study that, you better learn something about coins, young man. And so I, I did and have been doing so ever since. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty spectacular that something so small and what we would think of as mundane can tell you so much about these ancient people that information you wouldn't be able to get from anything else. Well, it's and, just and in a, in a sense, it's the small and mundane that makes it so important to us. Because when you think about coins, as I do, I, I think of them as tiny disks of information technology in which you, you intentionally cram as much data and I mean text and image and ideas onto a small surface as you can. And because it's mundane, because it's used in everyday life, it gets handed and transported from here to there and everywhere. And so coins quickly became the first means of mass communication in world history. And that's because they were small and transportable. And it's because they were mundane in the sense that they were woven into the fabric of everyday life. And though we, we greatly admire the magnificent um, inscriptions that are set up, um, the obelisks that are set up and so forth, of these grandiose statements and things of that uh, type. It's really the coins that um, speak to us most about what was going on in vast stretches of not only the ancient world, but in the medieval and modern world as well. Do you look at it from a global sense or in your book, do you sort of focus more on a particular region? Because my background is ancient history, and more specifically ancient uh, Greek and Roman history, I would say that there is um, 
the 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 weight sort of falls on, on that direction when when my mind goes to finding an example of how coins were used to do this or that then the first thing that come into my mind are the things from my own fields of study but one joy of writing this book was that it challenged me to move beyond the familiar frontiers of my own research and to think about how coins were used in the Islamic world, how they were used in East Asia, how they were used in the uh, medieval period, and right down to the modern day, and even I, I tackle things like cryptocurrency and the future of coinage in the book. So it, it does span the, the whole uh, breadth of um, world history for the last 2,600 years, but it is, um, it is weighted, I think, in some ways in its examples uh, toward mm -hmm. um, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. I mean, it's a massive undertaking, surely. I mean, I'm assuming that there's been a lot of different usages for coins throughout that time period. Absolutely. The many uses of coins, the many, if you're looking for something about which you could never get bored, then hardly enough coins are it because the variety is staggering. You know, there are tens of thousands of different kinds of ancient Greek coins. There are tens of thousands of different varieties of ancient Roman coins. And we have not even yet mentioned, you know, all the, all the coinages that have come along uh, since then in world history. And so uh, even, and even modern coins, which, you know, I, I challenge my students, you know, take a look at a, at a modern uh, U.S. coin, the ones they're most familiar with, they turn out not to be very familiar with them at all. If I to ask them, you know, who's the president on the dime, they 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 have no idea who that person is. Um, but then they can find an incredible amount of of history on them. I I tell them the, the cheapest education you can get in world history is to you know, take a handful of coins out of your pocket and um, you know for a couple of dollars. A couple of American dollars, you can survey an incredible amount of historic events. Because you're right, they people put so much information on coins, and even now I'm just thinking of all the different types. Like in even the last few years, I know when it was the Olympics, our two dollar coins would have like a different color band, and then yes. there was that you know you could try to collect all five colors, and even that's just a, a, such a small little you know couple of months where these coins are being produced. And, and if you think of that, that's true because in in the modern world, coins tend to become um, what I might call fossilized fairly quickly. And that is, if you again, I, I reach for examples in my own experience. But if you look at American coins, um, if you know future generations, two thousand years from now, are going to be confused about how long Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States. He's been in coins for a very long time. Um, and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, even longer. Our, our coins tend to um, change rather slowly, though when they do, it's quite significant. We, we now have a new series of quarters coming out in the United States that, that feature prominent uh, women in uh, American history. And, you know, and those certain attempts have been made in the past. This is much uh, uh, broad reaching in that respect. But in the ancient world, where coins were seen as mass communication, the coins changed on a very regular basis. And it was like picking up a newspaper. Who's, who's the emperor today? And sometimes in ancient Rome, it's different from one day to the next. Who's the emperor today? Have we won any big battles lately? Has anybody built any magnificent structures or commemorated anything in the past? Uh, which gods and goddesses are uh, are trending right now in our in our uh, empire in our civilization? It's it was a a constant um, uh, reminder of what's going on in the world around you, and and, and a, at a much quicker pace than we're com we're familiar with uh, today. But as I say, even today there are significant changes that occur, and when they do, we all take notice of them. That's fascinating because, I mean, when you think about, like, if I'm doing a project on the Roman emperors and I Google one of them, it's always a coin that comes up. And But even then, during their reign, depending on how long, even that can change, right? And sometimes you have two people, you know, co-reigning. Co <coughs> Absolutely. The coin. And their wives. And the empresses uh, come on coins. Some of, some of the most wonderful 
coins where an emperor commemorates um, a recently deceased wife by showing her empty uh, throne um, and her scepter lying across that empty throne and a, and a peacock, the symbol of, 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 of resurrection in the afterlife. And, and, you know, we don't often think of emperors as, as being that, um, th that touching, that emotional, uh, but that kind of thing really does come through. Their, their children um, will appear on the coin. So it's not just, you know, the emperors themselves. And they were a lively lot, as you know. Some of them were um, <laughs> a, 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 a little on the bent side, as we might say today. But when we look at, at the coins, we really do get a, a fairly balanced and, and deep, a rich history of uh, you know, not only their you know, public achievements, but also sometimes of their private lives. And having that glimpse into the private lives of these people that lived so long ago is just amazing that we get that. Um, why did you decide to write this book? Why did you decide to go through this history of coins? I've been teaching numismatics at the university for about 40 years now. And though I don't teach it every year, I teach it fairly often. And it's always an extremely popular course because students uh, sign up. Oftentimes they tell me, I don't know what numismatics is. I just signed up for the course because you know, people told me you were a good professor or it has something to do with the ancient world. So I thought I would take it. Uh, and, and once they start handling coins and realizing how much there is to be learned from them, the, that fire is lit uh, in them. And so it's always been something that um, uh, sort of energizes me whenever I teach the course. And I've taught over a number of years and I've, I've developed a lot of interesting I think, and new ideas about coins. Some of them are, are in the book, um, you know, treating coins as though they were sentient beings, for example, is, is uh, not a, a way that most people think of coins as having control over us more than we have control over them. But I developed these ideas and, and enjoy teaching the course and so forth. And I had written, um, I'd written and published eight books uh, uh, up to that point, And then I decided, I want to write something for everyone about coins. For for someone who's never looked at a coin, I wanted the book to be for them. And for someone who um, had never looked at a coin, or I wanted it to be for them too. I, I wanted to reach the general public. So I applied for a National Endowment for the Humanities grant, a uh, very, uh, very uh, important grant for this kind of work. And they have a public scholars program. For scholars to take a subject that is rarely taught or, or talked about in the academic world, like numismatics, and produce a book that will reach a, a general public and uh, inform them uh, in, in a very broad way about that field of, of study. And so I applied for the grant and was very fortunate. I, I got the grant. It, it gave me some time to expand what I knew about coins. I was one of those persons who uh, I knew a, a great deal about a few coins and I knew a little bit about a great number of coins, but I didn't know a lot about a lot of coins. And so that grant provided me the, the opportunity to to do the research. Um, and so it, it has been kind of a, um, in, in some ways, my way of giving back to numismatics some of the some of the joy that it's it's brought to me unexpectedly. Again, I never collected coins as a kid. I I never intended to do anything with numismatics when I went to study classical history. Um, it just I it just moved in that direction, and it's it's been a joy, and I wanted to share that joy with as many readers as I could. That's wonderful, and it's also nice knowing that you've written it with the intention that anyone can pick it up and learn about it because I, I don't recall doing that much about coins during my degree. Like I know every now and then they'd bring out a coin or two, of course. but to know that you can pick that up and, and start with a fresh mind and, and be able to understand and learn is, is always great because sometimes academic writing can be, you know, a little bit more. Well, and, and especially the more, you know, the more esoteric and specialized the subject can be. 
Um, you know, you can you can put a dozen of us ancient historians in a room, and sometimes the papyrologists can't really converse with the numismatist, and the numismatist can't really converse with the philologist, and uh, you know, our specialties sort of separate us out. And the one thing I learned writing this book, particularly about um, how coins were so significant in establishing the the Renaissance and antiquarianism, and were such an integral part of the study. Uh, in, in the renaissance of, of monuments, of languages, of art. Uh, I, you know, I came to appreciate that uh, uh, much more. And so, uh, you know, numismatics is still a, a field that is uh, largely waiting for workers to wander in and, and do their part. Uh, I tell my graduate students all the time that um, we often think that Boy, ancient history so long ago, it's been done. It's, you know, it's been done to death. Uh, that's not the case. We're finding new kinds of coins uh, every year. And then when you look at coin hoards and coins in archaeology, there's just no limit to the new information that's going to be gleaned about it in the future. That's so great to know that it's still an ever-developing field of study because you know some things you think you know we've got all the big things you know we found all of the big buildings and all of the amazing inscriptions what else could there possibly be to you know talk about but it's great knowing that this one is well we numismatists are like the papyrologists the papyrologists always know that the next fragment of papyrus that comes out of egypt might have Ptolemy's lost history of Alexander, and that would just revolutionize everything we know about an, a significant person in world history. And the same thing can be uh, true of coins as well. Uh, we, we just, we don't know what we don't know. And that's the thing that, that, that keeps us waking up every morning. And, you know, I, I go through and I, I look to see, well, have they found a new emperor yet? Sometimes they do. Have they, you know, s someone redates a coin and says, wait a minute, the, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius couldn't have happened um, on in August as we thought because of the movement of coins. It had to be, it had to be something else. Or where did, um, where did Varus lose those legions that Augustus was so upset about? Uh, Varus, where are my legions in the Battle of the Teutoburger Forest? Well, Thanks to recent coin finds in Germany at Valkyries, we now we now know where that took place. It's it's a constant flow of fresh information to us. So it's a, you know it, it is timely and exciting in that way. Yeah, so exciting. It must be so great to work in a field that is so ever developing and oh, so cool. Well, um, it's it's always important that you know when you're choosing a subject to devote your life to studying, that it is something that is likely to have fresh evidence coming along from time to time. Um, and, mm. you know, uh, physical objects, you know, material culture provides one of those things. So it's not just coins, but, you know, pottery and other things as well are, are, are constantly renewing themselves as fields of study. In your research, so as you said, Ellie, you had to sort of learn a lot about a lot of coins, you know, add on to your prior knowledge. What, was there something that was particularly surprising or exciting or interesting that you learnt in your research and in writing the book? Well, a lot of things. One thing, for example, is I was not only as an undergraduate, I was an English major as well as a, as a history major and I had a great fondness for English romantic poetry and things of that type. So one of the things I wanted to do when I was writing this book is say, all right, um, not just this, where coins are situated in our economic lives and so forth, but where are they in literature? Um, where do coins show up in the ancient um, Greek playwrights, for example, in Aristophanes, um, in the comic playwright Plautus in Rome? Where do coins show up in modern sitcoms on television? Where do they show up in uh, current um, uh, literature? And so I, I, one of the things that I found quite exciting was how many places I was able to find and, and draw information from coins 
uh, you know, I, I took the, the, the novel Silas Marner and came up with the, you know, the, uh, the Marner paradox for the study of, uh, of, of coin hoards. So that was one thing, the interaction of, of coins and literature. I would have thought before I did this research that nothing could be uh, less congruous than poetry on the one hand and a coin on the other. And as it turns out, they, 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 they interplay with each other quite well. And, and the other thing was all the great numismatists who've come before uh, studying the work that they'd done, the sacrifices that they had done. And the, in the book, I have a, a mild complaint that in the, in the modern world, no kid goes to the movies uh, and comes home and says, gee, mom and dad, I want to be a numismatist in the same way that a generation of kids went to the movies and came home and said, I want to be an archaeologist like Indiana Jones. We don't have um, that kind of swashbuckling, uh, heroic image of someone who, who studies coins. Uh, but I found that there were people whose lives, real lives, were far more engaging, far more extraordinary than even the fictional Indiana Jones. You know, uh, early explorers are looking for coins in um, 18th, 19th century Afghanistan and uh, came to grief as a result of it, were hacked to death by a mob or, or, or the, the, the poor guy who, who goes out to collect coins for um, uh, the king of France and finds a bunch of great gold coins and he's, 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 he's attacked and captured by pirates on the way back to France and oh doesn't want to disappoint the king so he swallows. Um, handfuls of gold coins and you know suffers the oh the the the, the uh, travails of passing those coins on later on and it's it's amazing to think some of those coins are now in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris uh, having made an extraordinary journey that sort of uh, mirrors the extraordinary journey of the numismatist himself so uh, you know there were numismatists who um, who went blind during the course of their um, during their studies, and yet continued to study coins based on the touch, the feel of coins, and could distinguish one coin from another, a portrait from another, based on feel. I mean, that, those are extraordinary things uh, and extraordinary people to be admired. And there are many great numismatists alive right now, many that I admire a great deal, but I had no idea how deep that bench was of, um, mm. of dedicated uh, scholars who collect and study coins. So obviously you've studied so many coins. Do you have a favorite one or a favorite type? Well, I, I suppose the obvious thing would be particular individual coins or small groups of coins that I have published a separate book monograph about. Obviously, I found quite fascinating enough to, to spend the time to write about them. I, I've... Um, I've written a book about um, the, the coins of um, of the first independent Greek kings and uh, of Bactria, what is now Afghanistan. I find those coins fascinating. The coins of Alexander the Great, um, and particularly these medallions that were minted, showing scenes of battle with elephants and chariots and so forth. Mm. Boy, that was that was a real challenge to try to interpret what those were all about. Uh, sometimes it's a coin um, that is is so unique and so extraordinary that it's still wondered, is this a genuine coin? Uh, could this be real? Um, there, there's a gold medallion of Alexander, for example, that, that now numismatists are divided in their opinions about. Um, because if it is genuine, if this, if this coin was minted by Alexander, it just, it proves beyond a shadow of doubt that this man... Um, believed and advocated and insisted that everyone see him as uh, the living embodiment of Zeus, as a god. So those mm -hmm. kinds of things. But but I, I didn't find any coins or groups of coins in my study that I said, well, I, I, I'd never give those a second look. Uh, there's something about almost every coin that's that's worth looking into more carefully. But the, yeah, there are there are a few that stand out in, in my mind, the Alexander coins and, and so forth. 
Is there much debate about many coins that are, that are falsified? Like, does that come up a bit, or is that not really? Oh, very of common? course, it's it's a huge it's a huge problem because we want to trust our evidence, and we have to develop all sorts of means by which we test the authenticity of a coin. It's, you know, it it sometimes it's straightforward. In the best of all possible worlds. We're studying coins that came out of a controlled archaeological excavation. And you know, this coin mm. is where um, someone said it was found and it was excavated, it was recorded, it was photographed and studied. There's a, you know, a, a chain of uh, a possession all the way through. But most coins, most by far, the vast majority of coins are not found in that kind of context. They come out of uh, plowed fields. They come out of hordes that are discovered by metal detectorists and so forth. And in some cases, um, and in some places, those coins are reliably uh, passed into the hands of academics. But the majority are not. And so when you come across a, a, a coin that is unique, that there's, there's no other example like this anywhere in the world that's been found, but we don't know, we can't be sure exactly who found it, where they found it, when they found it, uh, then we have to, you know, we have to be more careful with how much we burden that coin with historical weight. So it, it is a problem. Most people think counterfeit coins are a problem for coin collectors who are investing money and, and don't want to get burned uh, in the process. But it, it, uh, it is a torment for academics, especially because we you know, we want to present evidence that is genuine. And it's not a problem unique to, to coins and numismatics. You know, there are forged um, inscriptions, there are forged uh, documents that come on to the markets all the time. And they have to be, they have to be vetted in a very careful way. It, it keeps us on our toes. And I find the students, that's the most exciting thing they do in the course of a semester is when I, um, for example, I, I might be sent a photograph of a group of coins that um, a U.S. soldier brought back from Afghanistan and says, hey, I bought these coins in the local uh, bazaar and um, they're marvelous coins and I'll show these pictures to the students and say, okay, uh, are some of these genuine or none of, the, none of these genuine? How do you find out? And they really like the challenge of, of figuring out um, false coins from genuine coins. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. And I guess it just makes me think that archaeologists before, you know, the contemporary, you know, our archaeologists now just didn't have the same, um, they didn't put the same importance on provenance. <laughs> you know, they just go, oh, there's a thing, let's pull it out of, the dr out of the ground. And then you then have so much less to work with when it comes to, you know, when it, at what point was it buried, you know. Even, so it must be such a difficult thing to go through. Even now, there are many archaeologists, of course, who see a coin as no more than a chronological marker. And, mm. you know, I've, I've talked to archaeologists and been with archaeologists who say, well, uh, clean this coin uh, until there's nothing left, but try to find out the date uh, of this coin. And you, you wouldn't do that with any other artifact coming out of the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, they wouldn't say, yeah, scrub this pot until there's nothing <laughs> left on it. Uh, and so... More and more, though, archaeologists are becoming aware and, and, and employing numismatists on their sites where coins are likely mm -hmm. to be found and are working hand in glove together with, uh, with each other so that their special specialties complement each other's as they were always intended to do. So it's much more of a collaborative experience now, getting everyone's um, perspective, Absolutely. everyone's professional opinion. Absolutely. And <laughs> again, archaeologists are aware that coins uh, speak to us uh, about a lot more than just chronology. You know, the, the, if you're looking for trade patterns, if you're looking for periods of economic stagnation, well, you, you need to be looking at the coins very closely. And so th there is a, um, uh, you know, a, a heightened awareness now. Uh, there, I, I write in the book about how numismatics and archaeology once originated in the antiquarian period of the Renaissance as essentially the same pursuit. And then, particularly in the 20th century, these two disciplines parted ways. And the great divide um, 
came between them and still exist to some extent. But I try to make some suggestions about how the great divide can be uh, can be bridged as we go into the future so that archaeologists and numismatists are not um, as much as uh, at odds as they used to be. And that has a lot to do with the fact that numismatic still has a strong collector uh, component to it. And mm -hmm. academic numismatists uh, often work closely with coin collectors in ways that archaeological purists would say is, is not acceptable. And so we have to find a way that to find a practical solution to problems like that. Absolutely. And I guess overall, anyone working on a site, anyone working on, you know, in archaeology wants to get as much information that they can out of that site. So if that means not working in the old way, you know, not working with collectors, and then I guess that's just how they'll develop. And that's that's a system that'll. Exactly. E exactly. The, you know, there, there are those who say that if, if, if a coin isn't completely and thoroughly provenance, then it can't be treated in any way as an historical uh, object, as an historical document. And yeah. that once you've done that, you've eliminated 99.9% .9 of the millions of coins that, that are available for study to today. And again, to go mm -hmm. back to my analogy of finding the, the lost manuscript of the uh, a papyrus of Ptolemy's history of Alexander, if it weren't properly provenance, I don't think there'd be many classicists who said, well, we're not even going to look at it. We're not even going to read it. Uh, no, we're, we're going to want to look <laughs> at that thing very carefully. If it turns out to be genuine, it, it's irreplaceable. If it's false, mm -hmm. let's hope we will find a way to show that definitively and then move on. I, I'd like to thank um, all the people along the way uh, for this book. Again, it's my ninth, so it's, it's you know, it's... Um, but in many ways, it's um, you know it's it's my one of my favorites, and it really was possible only because I got excellent training in graduate school, that the American Numismatic Society in New York um, welcomed me as a as a student some years ago and provided the photographs that make the book uh, I think rather special. Um, students, colleagues, uh, other numismatists. It's a, it's a large community. I try to thank as many as I can in the book, but uh, I can't thank them enough. And uh, you know, I hope that when I get to book 12 and 20 and so forth, I'll, I'll still be thanking them. Well, that's a lovely place to leave this interview, I think. So Frank, thank you so much for joining me and the encyclopedia today. And if anyone is interested in buying the book, When Money Talks, we'll leave a link for that down below. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organization and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week. So make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.